Fags and Boards Podcast number 71. We back. Oh, comic fam. You know, we're available on SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes if you prefer to listen to our podcast. It's been a few months, but we got Fire Guy Ryan here. How you feeling, my brother? Waiting for it. You got to hit the button. You got to hit the Fire Guy Ryan. I know. I'm a little off. It's kind of That's nice. what happens, dude. You're losing the soundboard muscles. All right. Well, you know what? We have a fantastic show for you today. We have some breaking news as it pertains to the Spidey Sony-verse. We wrote a comic book. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Crashdown is available in previews, but I digress because we got the Golden Age Guru visiting the show today. We're going to talk about the giant comic book find we had last year. He's bringing some choice books. And you know when we got Fire Guy Ryan here? We're going to have a lot of fun. Hit the like and subscribe. And let's get into the show. Can you believe it? There is a saving grace, possibly, for the Sony Spider-Man franchise and like the just overall Spidey characters at large that they're in control that most people have written off since the failure of Morbius and since the failure of both Venom and Venom 2. Yeah, we've talked a lot recently about the Spider-Man Sony Venom universe they've got over there at Sony and... I don't know. I haven't been filled with a whole lot of confidence. It doesn't seem like they quite know exactly what they're doing, but we did just get a little bit of hints of news today about the upcoming Craven the Hunter movie, which looks like they're kind of course correcting, steering the ship in the right direction. The only thing we've heard of in the last few months is like updates on the Madam Web film. Madam Web and Hypno Hustler and the Mexican wrestler guy. I don't even remember the name anymore. El Muerto. El Muerto. Like, it seems like, what the hell are you guys doing over there thinking about, like, making movies out of these guys? And then I keep forgetting, oh, yeah, Craven the Hunter's got a movie, like, kind of closer than all of those ones. Aaron Taylor Johnson, you know him from Kick-Ass. And I was a little concerned at first. I love Kick-Ass, by the way. And he did a fantastic role at the job. But he's, like, a bit more scrawny of a dude. Nope. He went to the gym, he's looking ripped, and he's taken on the Craven role. And there was a teaser dropped over this last week. It was like a private event. Members of the audience had to like keep their phones away. So I wasn't even able to get a like leaked trailer to actually view it. But we had a lot of scoopers talking all about it. And the first big news that I think goes with your course correcting verbiage here and is going to totally change how I view potentially the Sony handling of Spider-Man projects is the R-rated film that this just got granted. Yeah, apparently this is going to be a graphic, bloody, uh, hardcore movie, which uh, I guess makes sense when you consider Craven the hunter likes to hunt and kill things. Kind of makes sense that you got an R rating here, although I wish we, in retrospect, we should have had an R for, for Venom. You know, apparently Morbius didn't have any blood in it. I still haven't subjected myself to watching Morbius, but apparently there's no blood in your vampire movie, which makes no sense. Do you remember when we were on the airplane going to a convention and we were all watching different movies? What movie was I watching? Like The Departed? I think you were watching The Departed for your very first time. I was very proud of you. I was geeking out. I was pausing it. I'm like, dude, oh my God, this movie. And then we look over to the right and we're watching The Golden Age Guru, watching Morbius. And yo, his he jaw was, was dropped. He was glued to the screen. He was leaning forward and like we kind of sneakily recorded some video footage of him. Maybe if we I can, have it, I'll put it up. Maybe we can drop it into the podcast here. But he was locked into Morbius. And it then made he me caught feel us, like I needed to watch the movie. He caught us looking at him and got like super embarrassed and guilty. <laughs> but we got it on camera. Well, apparently Aaron Taylor Johnson like went on stage at this premiere and he was in full Craven outfit. It, apparently he was like on all fours going up the stairs. He was yelling and screaming. He said, this is going to be a F and R rated film. And they showed like teases of the movie. And sure enough, there is a point that is being described as him, quote, biting off Poacher's nose and spitting the remains at the camera. That sounds pretty fun. Right? It's always cool when people's noses and other face parts get bitten off by somebody else. That'll make for a wild movie. Uh, apparently, we also got a confirmation that the rhino is going to be appearing in this movie, but not the same rhino that we last saw in live action played by Paul Giamatti in Amazing Spider-Man 2. He was like a crazy Russian tracksuit guy in a, in a giant mech suit. You and I saw that in the movie theater. I also have not seen that movie since then. I'm glad we're getting a different version. They're saying that he's going to go full rhino, and it's instead of it being like a mechanized suit, that he's actually going to, quote, transform in the film. So this is something brand new. Didn't see this coming. And it makes me 
relook at the Sony slate differently. I'm going to like take Madam Web seriously at this point if they're willing to make these types of risks. Yeah, I was already kind of weirdly excited for Madam Web. I think it's going to be a little bit removed. You were removed. excited for Madam Web? It sounds like it could be interesting, you know? I don't I'm not I wouldn't say I'm excited for a Hypno Hustler or El Muerto or whatever the hell else we've got going on, but something about Madam Web was kind of like that sounds weird enough to be interesting. But dude, like why else would Childish Gambino know? sign up for a obscure character unless it was going to be something we didn't expect like an R-rated film. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is this is good news is all I'll say. It's good news and I'm I'm looking forward to more Sony stuff. Maybe now I will finally watch Venom 2. We have talked in length about random appearances of amazing Spider-Man issues that make the hot 10. The comics that are the hottest in the world that we cover every single week with Gem Mint from Gem Mint Collectibles. It's your boy Gem Mint. And we'll randomly get this spider key that'll hit the list and yeah there may be some like low-key spec pointing to the animated films or like potential mcu spec but when it really comes down to it i always say the same thing there's a variable added to the collectible as it pertains to amazing spider-man that makes it so that it's kind of irrelevant what's happening on the screen it's like the most beloved character the most collected and almost safe investment we've seen drops across the board for many comics but it's routine that we'll see a random comic book spike because it's high grade Spidey. So this right here makes me feel even more so excited about following the collectible and the potential investment value of Spidey characters that we haven't really chatted about since like the Sinister Six spec for the latest Spider-Man film. This may feel like a weird transition, but I got to shout out Key Collector here. My favorite feature of the Key Collector app, the Key Alerts, where it just pings your phone and notifies you when certain... Trailers drop when news breaks, when there's uh, situations like this where you have a panel and stuff, get, stuff gets announced. Um, we got an alert for the Rhino. We got an alert for Craven the Hunter. All of this stuff kind of combined into one big alert, and it shows you some of the uh, important Rhino keys. Uh, one of them being Amazing Spider-Man 42. That's the Rhino's second appearance, but also the first appearance of Mary Jane Watson where she appears at the end and says, Face a tiger, you just hit the jackpot. They've referenced that a million billion different times throughout all the comics. And speaking of ASM41, what's this? We have an ASM41 first print graded at a 5.0 that we're going to be giving away because the podcast is back, damn it. And we're going to be giving it away at the end of May. And all you need to do is sign up to our newsletter. That way, when we do the random name generator, we're able to contact you because you already have provided us your email. Link in the description. That's actually the best way to keep up with the changes that we're making to like the mail call, any updates, but also when we do drops at conventions, you'll be notified there so you don't miss them. Yeah, we also used to do giveaways in like the comment section, like comment down below to be entered in for a chance to win. And we randomized the names that way, but we also had a lot of people jumping in and impersonating Comic Tom 101. No good. That didn't really work out well. It was confusing, not to mention fraudulent and sketchy. So yeah, we're just we're just doing it this way. It's a lot easier. Just head to ComicTom101.com and sign up for the newsletter. We wrote a comic book, Ryan, and holy smokes, it has Definitely delayed the podcast a little bit, but I am proud to say that issue one is like wrapped up. Issue two is also wrapped up as it pertains to the writing and being drawn right now as we speak. Issue three is written and in line after issue two, and the book's going to drop in July. We're talking about our project with living horror legend Ben Temple Smith, Crashdown. Yeah, it's exciting. And if you look back at the last podcast we did, it was like in October or so, right when we sort of got this project off the ground. We got the original art in from Ben Temple Smith for that first cover. We unboxed it on camera and then we completely stopped the podcast. Yeah, basically, we didn't realize how much work it would be. We took on like a part time job, if not and some. And it's been a wild ride, but we wanted to kind of like let you in on what we've experienced over this last year and how we got to this point and to let you know that it's available in previews right now. We would love your support. Please hit up your LCS, go to previews, order some covers, and let's chat about like the road to get here because this all started in Denver when we got invited by Whatnot to cover the launch of a brand new publishing company. Right. We're talking about last summer. Whatnot reached out and asked if you and I would like to fly down to Denver Fan Expo and cover the launch of their new publishing line called Whatnot Publishing. Brand new comics being released. All we knew was that there was going to be a few titles. And we knew like JPG from that Spider-Man booth was releasing a comic called Ninja Funk. We hadn't seen any of the pages yet. Exiled with Wesley Snipes attached. Quested and Alpha Betas, which all I knew was like a little bit of YouTube stuff. 
that's all we really could research. But we took the trip down to Denver and did the convention like we typically do. You know, we set up and had the hotel room planned out and did a podcast that was very unique because we have never really done interviews in that style. I'll put the link here for you to check it out. But we were the first ones to cover the launch of this publishing company. And it was a really special thing because that morning we received the ash cans. And that was our first look at these comic books. Uh, do you remember how you felt? Like, I was a little nervous at the time because I knew I was going to be interviewing these creators. But what I didn't want to have to manage around was like, oh, what if I'm not a big fan of these comics? Like, I'm not sure what we're going to read. What are these going to be like? You know, I was thinking maybe like there may be a kid's book in there or there may be something that just really isn't my vibe. But I was like pleasantly surprised. And as soon as I read it, I remember going to you going, what'd you think, dude? And what did you say? Yeah, that's pretty much the same vibe I had. I was, I was, we were going in pretty much completely blind and I had, I had no idea what to expect. And thankfully, like Tom said, all the four things we read in there, they were pretty good. And it was a relief. It was like, okay, I can comfortably sit down and talk to the people who created these things right in front of us across from a table and not have to like, I love this, you know, like <laughs> pretend like I love something I hate it. You know, it's, it's, it was a relief in that sense. So we did. We sat down. We talked to the creative teams for all four of these different books, minus Wesley Snipes, and I think there were a couple other people who couldn't make the actual convention. But we got to have pretty in-depth discussions in a very, very, very hot hotel room with no fans. I was a little uncomfortable in this in this hot hotel room, but it was it was a good experience for our members who've been following us for a long time. I'll give you a little like peek behind the curtain, you know, behind the scenes, if you would. I've been doing the trending list video for five years plus now. The hot ten hitting three years now. Every week, without skipping a beat, I've been sick on camera, I've done videos by myself, and when I do conventions, it's not like I can record this video early in time for the convention. I'm either doing it the night before I leave, if the convention is a Thursday night trip, or I have to do it at the hotel, you know, on Friday morning before I can even go to the convention. Sometimes there's like members of the community wanting to meet me on Fridays, and I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to be able to hit the convention. I still have to do the trending video. So my grind typically looks like doing a lot of research Thursday night when I'm at a convention, like in the hotel room, all my friends are out having fun and I'm researching books. And then Friday morning, I'm filming it with whoever's there or by myself. And in this case, I had to do all of that, read the ash can, go to the convention, witness the launch of whatnot publishing, watching them sell their ash can and seeing just crazy crazy prices. The excitement was unlike anything I'd ever seen for the launch of a comic book run, let alone multiple comic book runs. And then seeing these creators who are like the stars of the show, David Mack, you know, Kevin Eastman was part of this launch. And then we had the team just showing up in waves all throughout the day where we're doing these like 20, 30 minute conversations that we edited down and made a podcast of. Yeah, it was, a, it was a different experience. It's not like this where we're in our studio with our equipment. You know, we had to bring these smaller microphones. We had to bring a whole bunch of lights. It was this, all these big hot lights in this hotel room with no open windows, no Dude, fans going. Hot in the middle hell. of summer, I was like dripping sweat, uncomfortable. We had, our, He's not exaggerating. This guy can sweat. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a sweaty man. Oh, yeah. But no, there was this bench that we were sitting on. There was no back, so I couldn't like, I was not comfortable physically. And in every sense of the word, I was not comfortable talking to all these new people I'd never met before about their books. And it was a big, exciting day. It was a lot. It was a big, it was a big day. And reading all four of these uh, samples, because, again, we only had, like, three, three, pages three four so. pages of each book. So you get a little taste. Some of them didn't even have dialogue. I think Ninja Funk, there was no uh, letters. Art. Yeah, it was just, just all art. it was all art, and some of the panels have already been scrapped. Yeah, there was that, too. So we just kind of – it looks cool. You know, it was yeah. still very early. But uh, overall, the main takeaway after reading it was, like, this is a cool lineup, but it's missing a horror book. There was no horror to our chagrin. But what was fun is that after the podcast, after meeting everybody on the team, we realized that this wasn't as much of an interview we were doing to learn from them. In retrospect, this was like an interview that they did with us, and we were deciding in that moment this would be the publishing company that we would go with. You know, I had been shopping around a comic book idea. I already had been friends with Ben Templesmith for a quite a long time. We've done a lot of covers. He lived up here in Washington for a number of years, hung out with him pretty regularly. And we had chatted about doing a comic for over a year up until that point. And shout out to Michael Calera and Kevin Rotatelli, the uh, uh, co-founders of Massive and Whatnot Publishing. They approached me and said, hey, we know that you're 
in the process of doing something with Ben Temple Smith. We're huge fans. And you're right. There's no horror. There's no sci-fi at this point that they were releasing. And they wanted to know if we would consider bringing that to them and being part of this big team. Yeah. And then at some point they just reached out to you and asked if you'd want to take that comic book under the what not publishing umbrella instead of a different publisher. Absolutely. And that was the point where I realized, Oh snap, this was something I thought I was going to do myself and it would be kind of like a side project. And then, I imagine it would take a couple of years to actually like manifest that, you know, make it happen. But I soon realized we got to get this rolling because I would love to release this in 2023 if it was possible. And that's when I reached out to you. Yeah, that was a pretty fun conversation. You were just like, hey, so it turns out like you you had mentioned to me you were thinking of doing a comic with Ben Temple Smith. And I remember you shot me some ideas with like this insane asylum. There was some some storyline you ran past me and I was like, nah, dude, that's not very good. Think of some <laughs> other book to do with Ben Temple Smith. Good, good luck. You know, have fun. You know, I was just like a removed kind of sounding board you were you were looking for feedback from. And then after this conversation with Whatnot, you reached out and you were like, yo, I think uh, I think I want to write a comic book with you and, and Ben Templesmith on the art. And I basically just went, uh, yes, yes, please. But not the asylum one. <laughs> like, let's let's find some other idea. And that's kind of how Crashdown first started. Now, we have some Q&As for members of the community over on Instagram. Make sure to follow us both, Fire Guy Ryan and Comic Tom 101. We do random polls and questions that we'll bring to the mic so we can give you some shout outs. And we're going to get to what Crashdown's about. But before we do that, let's show you the trailer. Life beyond our home on Earth is now possible thanks to our galactic research scouting team and advancements in suspended animation and cryotechnology. With the sun's demise imminent, we are now 72 hours from departure from planet Empyrean. With a 95% chance for Earth-like conditions, your efforts will be vital for the successful continuation of our species. On behalf of the entire human race, we here at Apollo Industries thank you for your service. With the dramatic increase in solar rays, 95% chance for Earth life conditions. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. How does that feel, man? That's our comic. We like brought it to life with a lot of help. Shout out Michael Calero, who edited the book, and Ben Templesmith. And shout out Chaylin, our editor, who kind of literally brought it to life in this case by doing voices and all of the effects and just built that whole trailer from the ground up with no direction from us either. That was all That was all him. That was great. I love that thing. I could watch that all day, and I'm probably going to. So let's tell them a little bit about Crashdown. We posted a question to the community over on Instagram, and this is what they had to say. All right, so this first one comes from, actually, it's kind of from two different people asking the same question. We got Joel's Man Cave, as well as Dr. Pla Plagueis. I see you all the time. I know how to spell your name. I don't Dr. Know, I've Plagueis. Never, I've never said it out loud before. Plagueis. Plagueis. Whatever. What are some of the influences and inspirations behind Crashdown? One of the first pieces of advice I got was from uh, illustrator Kevin McGuire. You know him from his work over at DC doing things like JLA. You're going to see a Crashdown cover from him as well. I'm very excited about that. But he said, write the comic you wish existed. And it's kind of like the same tip for like writing a movie, a script that you wish existed. And the first movie I thought of was Pandorum. This is gonna be a little bit of a spoiler warning for a movie that's like over 15 years old. Norman Reedus is in this movie, by the way, and this is like pre-Walking Dead. So it's pretty old, but the ending is the characters arriving at the planet that they are traveling to throughout the entire movie. It turns out they were there and it ends happy ending with their arrival. And I always thought it would be so cool to see what happens next. You know, when these humans are trying to expand to this planet for the first time and what they're going to find, is it going to be similar to Earth? Like I had all these questions in my like young adult years because it was a very impactful movie. So clearly you're going to see some, uh, you know, tributes to that, if you would. But it's definitely very unique. For me, uh, there's a lot of different uh, influences and inspirations, but I think if I had to pick one, the biggest one for me personally is Lost. Uh, that TV show, again, that's another old one. That's like almost 20 years old at this point. Holy smokes. Uh, yeah, that came out while I was in like middle school. Yeah, I was high school on that one. That was a, that was possibly the single most influential piece of fiction that I have consumed in my entire life. The way that story is built is just mind-blowing to me still. But the uh, overall themes, I guess, and the story structure of people uh, having to survive in a crash landing scenario and the things they go through and the 
interpersonal conflicts and struggles that happen. I'm, I'm being very broad with uh, Lost, obviously, but there's some sci-fi elements in there, too. There's uh, a lot of flashbacks in the way they structured the actual episodes. I think uh, we, we kind of pulled a lot of uh, good parts from Lost and uh, applied that to our comic here, too. So those, I'd say, are probably two of the biggest ones, but there's a lot of smaller ones that we could run down to real quick. Alien, there's there's body horror. Like, we're writing the story that we wanted to order, if that right. makes sense. You know, we didn't make this in mind to try to appease a general audience. And, you know, like, we wrote a story that excited us because we knew that if we put our passion into it with a genre that we like to talk about, that we like to read, and that we enjoy personally outside of the studio, that we would be able to bring our best game to a comic book because we want to like make the community have a great time with it if they're going to support it and buy it. True. I also want to shout out The Miss and The Ruins. Two Absolutely. really good movies, that uh, two really good books that they're based off of too as well. Those are definitely in the DNA of Crashdown as well. And what's the next question? This one comes from Run It Back Jeremy over on Instagram. What's the elevator pitch of the book? You're answering that this time, Tom. I'll do the elevator pitch for you. We've been having to do it a lot because we've been joining a lot of different channels on YouTube. Shout out to John's Comics with Kids, Comic Journey, Rage Theo. And if you want us on your channel to talk comics, to talk Crashdown or anything, now's the best time to reach out. Hit up Fire Guy Ryan over on Instagram. Crashdown is about humans attempt to populate a new planet because Earth is dying. Simple as that. We're going to follow the first 48 hours of the first scouting team's experience because they have to pave the path for the rest of the humans on the larger ship that is anxiously waiting to join them down below. That's pretty good. That worked. I'm doing it like different right? every time. It's it's hard. It's a, it's a big, complex story. It's hard to just kind of blip, spit out like a two-sentence description of everything that happens and everything that goes wrong in the storyline. Well, dude, it's a horror story, and I'm trying to protect that level of surprise that we're building into this story. The beats, you know, the tension, and you can't spoil it too much, you know? Yep. Okay. That's enough. Enough said. We'll move on. And there's tentacles. Lots of tentacles. This next response comes from uh, our friend Davis Ryder. I'm not really sure what this is about. He says, what the f*** did Joe do? What the hell, Davis? I don't even know what you're talking about. I the dude. Who, I don't know who Joe is. He's just trying to mess with us, man. Moving I've been on. doing these exclusives with this dude. He's an <laughs> artist. He's super talented. And then he just does this kind of stuff. He's pissing me off. Yeah, let's keep going. Oh, hey, this one uh, This one is a response from my cousin. Uh, this comes from Magic Maker Megan. We've also got a response here as well from Oliver Yo Body. Another name I recognize. Shout out to both of you. Uh, they're both wondering how they get autographed copies. You can order the comic now on previews. And if you ever see us at a show doing any type of event, we're not charging for signatures. This is something that Mike Mignola told me back in the day, something that was told to me by Matt Wagner. Once you make a decision to not charge for your signatures, you kind of just stick to it long term to give back to your community that supported you, that resonated with me. I got a lot of Mignola signatures. <laughs> but all that to say, meet us up at a show, but also ComicTom101.store. I'm going to be selling a lot of these comics there, so you'll be able to support us in that way. But I'll also include signed copies as an option for no additional cost. There you go. That was a pretty succinct response. I like that. Next one comes from our friend Luke Sims. What was the most challenging aspect of creating this book? Working with Ryan. Every yeah. single day was a nightmare. I am this a diva. dude. He doesn't like any of my ideas. He nope. always wants to change everything. And he's always trying to incorporate things that no one wants in the book. No, I'm just kidding. No, Goodfellas actually... in space. <laughs> yeah, dude. Let's this do guy that. loves like mafia <laughs> and and like uh gangster books. And yeah. I'm like, dude, we got Ben Temple. The market's wide open, dude. He's like, it's like Sopranos meets Lost. I'm like, it doesn't make sense, dude. <laughs> oh, God. I would unironically read the hell out of that comic, though. <laughs> okay, no. I would be the only person, too. But like, for real, though, like, what would you say has been the most challenging thing? Because I think us working together went swimmingly. We Weirdly well, actually. Yeah. I, I would have thought two writers working together would have more yeah, conflict and Agreement or disagreements, I guess, ideas that don't mesh well. Uh, as far as things that didn't work, challenges, uh, I think overall, the biggest thing is probably like switching my brain from like comic reader to comic creator. And like when you're reading so many comic books, you kind of take for granted things like word balloon placement and how many lines of dialogue can fit in one panel and on one page. And how long is one comic book page really, especially when you're writing it in a script or things like when do we use their character names? We didn't name any of these characters. We didn't name drop them in any part of this issue. Nobody knows what their names are or who these people are. Things like that that you don't really 
uh, think about your first your first draft. So like I would say a little bit of all of those things. Discovering how to organize the script, how to make sure to hit all the points, going from a rough draft to a final draft is a tremendous amount of like editor help, artist looking at everything, providing prelims, us trying to like rethink how it could be done. And then also knowing when to kind of let off the gas and let other individuals kind of provide their tips on how it could be done better because they're more experienced than us. We definitely leaned on our team, but I would say that I'm surprised how much of this book is just us. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, there was not really any, uh, roadblocks thrown up by editorial or, you know, the publisher saying like, no, this has to change. You guys can't do this. This doesn't work. I mean, some, some things had to be fixed and shout out Michael for like steering us. Right. But there was a few times where he's like, didn't expect that. I like this. Cool and I'm twist. Like, and I surprised. Didn't I was waiting. Coming. I was waiting for the, this is crap. Redo six pages. Right. You know, this isn't going to work. Like uh, thanks for trying, but we're going to go with some other comic instead. You know, none of that. I mean, I, that's kind of how I am. I'm a pessimist, so I would I was expecting that the whole time anyway. But no, I think we're in good shape. Next question is from Ganjabar's Medium. This kind of ties into the last one. What was your favorite part of the process, writing your first comic? Congrats, you guys. In retrospect, my favorite parts have been when we figure out the things that we both like. The moments where we go back and forth, and sometimes we think, hey, this is just one page. It should be easy. And then we spend hours on one or two panels. But when we get it, it's a feeling of accomplishment that it's like, you know what? We thought we were going to get a page done. We got two panels and we're high-fiving and hugging each other. Like, we did it. I think this is good, yo. It's those moments that really just got me so excited to then hit the ground running again the next day. I've had this kind of uh, mental block, I guess, this whole time where, like, I've, I've written things before in my life, but they've never gone anywhere. They've never done anything. I'll, I'll write something and just, like, stash it in Google Drive and it just sits there and withers away and dies. Dude, you, like, back in the day when you worked at the hotel and you were, like, doing that full time and not doing comics like you are now, I remember you writing scripts when you were just doing the night shift. Yeah, there's a lot of downtime in that job. So, yeah, I would do a lot of writing. I read a lot of digital comics on Comixology while I was pretending to be working on the computer. So don't tell my old boss. Actually, go tell him. Who cares? I'm not there anymore. But, no, there's there's been this process of writing this where it just felt like, yeah, fine, we're just, we're just having fun. We're just writing this story together. But it wasn't until, you know, seeing the first designs come in from Ben Temple Smith or getting the first cover or seeing the final artwork come in or some of these variant covers. And now now we're in previews and now there's a trailer coming and it's like it's getting closer and closer and closer. And we're like getting really good responses from people and like excitement and like it's becoming this real thing. And there's a sort of like imposter syndrome vibe that sets in and it's like this isn't me. This isn't real life. This isn't happening. This is just something we've been cooking up together for fun. But no, it's happening. It's about to be published. And I think that is uh, the most fun part of this process, like kind of the slow peeling back of the curtain. And it's like, no, this is real. This is happening. Get ready. And I'm not ready. Yo, we're working with one of my favorite artists of all time. And he's drawing our characters, creating them. We had this idea for a monster and going through the process of like what it could look like and then kicking it to Ben, him providing his two cents. Like it is such a unique experience that I feel like I got a promotion. You know, like I've been doing uh, the the YouTube stuff and the comic dealing full time for over five years now. I know I started doing it when I was a kid with my dad, but like, you know, I, I had a different career path and then, you know, I really went all in on comics and it's felt very similar for five years. You know, I'm doing a lot of the same videos and a lot of the same, you know, you make comics. And this podcast. Mail call, this podcast, exactly. And then adding this to the slate has been a completely different job. I'm using a different part of my brain and I'm having so much fun and I feel like I'm doing something right. Yeah. I don't want to jinx it or anything, but I think we, I think we got something good. I'm going to move on to the next question. What if it really sucks? It could really suck, <laughs> but you won't know unless you try it. You Wait gotta for, go. Yo, Bleeding Cool put us on like an article and we were on like the main page for a second. Yeah. Wait for the next Bleeding Cool article when they're like, like this Comic sucks. Tom and Fire Guy Ryan messed up Ben Temple Smith art. Yeah. The blame <laughs> will fall on us too. Cause Ben, how can you, you know, Ben T can do no wrong. All right, next question comes from J.G. Vatex WSS. <laughs> Great name. I'm sure that stands for something or that means something, but how mature will the comic go from a scale of Justice League to The Boys? How mature? Yeah. Mature. All right, so it's definitely not boys graphic it's or a horror sexual. Book. We just watched horror. the trailer. It's, there's people getting ripped to bits in there. There's, there's, there's some shocking gore in this book. It's definitely mature 
it's not as mature as The Boys, but it's definitely not going to be Aaron on Disney+. Plus. Right. And The Boys definitely has kind of a, a sexual angle to it as well that we don't really have in this book. There's there's a lot of blood and guts in certain points. There's a little sexiness. A little bit. A little poquito, tiny bit. A little poquito. Sure. But it's not like, you know. Yeah, we got a lot of young fans too. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole different conversation. But yeah. No, I, I think you're right. Somewhere between Justice League and The Boys, maybe a little closer to The Boys, but I'd say comfortably in the middle. Yeah, we dropped some F-bombs, you know. There's some curses in here. It's for big kids. That's right. All right. What do we got? This is number 10. We're almost done. The Collector Without Fear. A David Matt cover for your first comic. How much did you geek out over that one? Dude, about poop my pants. <laughs> yeah. That's, again, that's another part of that imposter syndrome. Like, what the hell's happening? This is us. Wait, hold on. I've seen David Mack all the time. I've drooled over David Mack all the time. This is us. This is our book. That's our title. Oh, my God. Yo, we got Ben T on all the cover A's, of course, because he's the interior artist. We have David Mack. Fortunately, our editor, Michael Calero, is a very talented individual and is not just an editor and not just leading publishing. He is an artist as well. He does the art on Alpha Betas. So he's actually contributed a Metroid Prime homage, you know, giving us that like classic Nintendo homage that One Out Publishing has been like really known for producing the highest quality of. Um, Zoo Orzu, who we've done so many covers with, it, it felt so special to be able to have her contribute to the project. But we also have... Johnny freaking Desjardins, my brother, Illis Duminati, Javon Jordan's done a cover as well. Um, Casey Parsons is part of the release, and we have so many other fantastic names that we haven't released yet. Yeah, all, all together, it's uh, a little bit humbling, and uh, it feels good. That's the, that's the honest answer. It feels, it feels really good. All right, this is the last one. Comics Fan 1973. Did you have other artists in mind for the project, or did you both come to the same conclusion on your own? Zero other artists were considered. Um, again, when this was all proposed for us to bring it to whatnot, this was already moving. I was already planning and shooting ideas over to Ben Temple Smith. He was telling me what he didn't want to do, things he didn't like to draw. You know, I was reading through so much Ben T like indie goodness and rereading 30 days a night and, and checking out fell again and just like going through scripts that he's been provided in the past that he okayed for me to like, use as inspiration so I can learn how the creator artist, the writer artist conversations worked and, and the best way that he worked. So I was spending a lot of time like gearing up to write. I got like the Stephen King book on writing, the Mike, Brian Michael Bendis book that you recommended. So I was doing like a lot of that stuff and gearing up for what I thought would be like a Kickstarter at best, you know, something small release. You know, I wasn't thinking it would be something that would be in previews, but when we got offered... It was like, no, we got Ben Temple Smith, and he got, got our foot in the door. So. Yeah, he was he was on board before I was. That's really how it goes, is uh, Tom and Ben Temple Smith and then Fire Guy Ryan. But, yo, Crash Down began with us. You know, we had all these ideas written out, and there were times that we were focusing in on a narrative dystopian future where it was more Earth-focused, but then we were thinking of maybe going more Battlestar Galactica vibes and doing, like, a spaceship story, you know, alien vibes, if you would. And then, of course, Lost and our our love for those types of Survival narratives. Survival horror. You know, and, and, yeah. and not telling a linear story. That was, like, one of the first ideas we had. Oh, we're yeah. like, let's not do a linear story. You were like, 100%. I'm in. Lost. And I'm like, yep, okay. So now we're talking about island stuff. And all of a sudden, we stood back, and I'm like, dude, what if all of this is Crash Down? Let's throw it in a pot and stir it up. We got some good gumbo stew going. And you can order it now. On previews, hit up your LCS, support what we do, and let's welcome the Golden Age Guru. So I want to do a little bit of a test here. We got the Golden Age Guru back on the podcast. Hot damn, it's been too long. But we got to get right to it. Ryan, we have had the Guru enter the studio and it smells different. And that's how you know Jeff is here. It's that golden age. You can smell it, right? I meant like the stew, the golden age stew, which is emanating from, that's what we call him, the no, golden no. age guru. Jeff has a funk about him. Ryan, I need you to just oh. breathe in through your nostrils, clear your sinus passages. Do you mm. smell the difference of this room? A little hot, yeah. It's three, three sexy dudes in here. There's certainly a smell. Well, what you're smelling right now. Well, two sexy dudes. It is the smell of old paper. I can literally smell it on the table. The Golden Age Guru brought books. And Jeff, we haven't talked about the collection find, my biggest collection uh, purchase I've ever been part of in my lifetime, possibly forever. Shout out Comic Butch. And we haven't never talked about it on the mic. No, we haven't. And just to be clear, that odor is also a little mixture of Dr. Squatch, which is new to my showering uh, routine. On top Recommend. of that. 
So I had good experience with that guy. <laughs> but on top of that, yes, we're finally going to dive into these books in this podcast. All right, it's been too long since I've been here. I've missed you guys. So let's dive into some of this stuff because I brought just a sample. This is a small sample. Run it down real quick. We got a collection last year, 300,000 plus comic books. We're still going through it. And you got a lot of the golden age books because you're the golden age guru. And in the very beginning, I think I even told you, I'm like, dude, I don't even know what to do with stuff like this. This has got to be in your part of the investment. I'll stick to what I know. Yeah, I mean, we're talking closer to 350,000 books here with um, a good chunk of it. When I say good chunk, I'd say maybe, you know, a good 2,000 Golden Age books, if you think about it. And then it kind of moves from there to the silver, bronze, copper, all the way to modern. So there is a lot to go through. We're kind of taking our time. Definitely taking the time with the, and the Golden Age stuff. The market dipped at the worst, but also best time because it's taking us so long to get through it that... As we're finding these keys, we're like, yeah, but we don't really want to sell them right now. We've said that a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely being picky choosy. I'm holding off on the silver and bronze age keys because that stuff dropped 50 to 100% plus on some. Uh, Golden Age is holding steady. Try not to rush through that. Um, But yeah, we're putting stuff out, man. But God, there's a lot of hold right now. All right. So we have a bunch, actually a few comics on the table that are all face down. I don't know what they are right now, but I have seen all these books from the collection. But Fire Guy Ryan has not. I'm coming in cold. He's coming in cold. So um, do you want to give us an idea, maybe start it out by the uh, price that you would believe this to be worth in a average market, maybe right now. I don't know. I'm sure you have some pricing in mind with these because I'm sure the audience is very interested in that. But why don't you just hit us? Because I asked you to bring some of the fire, like the heat, the stuff that's going to radiate and make this room unbearable. So I'm assuming you brought some really expensive comics. Yeah, let's just dive in here, okay? Um, What I started with was possibly one of the most famous gals in all of comics. If not, we're just going to jump into Wonder Woman because this collection, it didn't have her first appearance. dude. Okay, we're doing yeah. this. Okay, <laughs> here, Ryan. Hold here, I know what no, this give is. It. You Ryan. have to hear. Put it in Ryan's it. hand. Oh, Holdy, Ryan. All right, so uh, Ryan, Dude. why don't you describe what we're looking at here? We got to start them one by one. Hit them with just one by one. This is Sensation Comics issue number one. As far as I'm aware, this is the first appearance of Wonder Woman, and that just shows how unaware you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not. Right, it's her second appearance. Okay, because her first appearance it's was got a number one though in All Star Comics number. Eight. 18. Eight. Right. Eight. 18 close. minus 10. We got eight. We got, we got close. It. Ryan is getting their comment in the comment section. Let stuff. him know he's this doing is good. All my, this is not my wheelhouse. I don't even like holding this, man. Okay. So first off, yeah, give me. check this out. Breathe. I'm wafting the book. Are you? Do you smell it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Dude, you got to do some like neti pot or something. Mm-mm. How do you my, not? It's just a mucus. I, you it's all mucus this? out there. Nothing gets okay. out there. All right, I'm going to send it over to oh, Jeff. Wait, no, I'm I got send it. it. I just got you it. You got it? Yep. Jeff, a, let me know when you can smell waft. it. I'm, I'm wafting across the table. I'm nose blind at this Dude, point. It's a normal odor. <laughs> okay, this whole room smells like it, but yeah, we're holding a Sensation Comics number one. It says January right on the top. Mm-hmm. Wonder Woman in all her glory getting very, shot at. Very uncomfortable with all this. All right, well, anyways. Oh, making me smell that. Smell okay, that right there. that's, that's what's smell happening. That right there. Yeah, now you got it. Now you can smell it. It smells good. That's the good stuff. Okay, Jeff, riff about this comic book because it looks gorgeous. It does look gorgeous, and I'm going to tell you something. Um, It had a Sensation Comics run. Great. We'll get into other books of it, but this is the first issue. Now, this book, all right, being her second appearance, was fully encapsulated in plastic just like this, okay? This is sealed on all four sides, all right? Just a sheet of plastic. like a homemade slab. Right. This is an All-Star Comics number two, which is completely (laughs) sealed. I had to take it out of this because I noticed that there was restoration and I was trying to understand why they were sealed. So what happened along the way is this collector either bought these books that were restored by somebody and fully sealed at some point. I've never seen this before, but there was five books just like this. So that book you can handle. I think the staples have been replaced. It's been restored. You can hold on to it like a brand new book and not worry. And usually the golden age is very um, durable can anyway. I it? Can I take yes, it out? Yes, please of take it out. Oh, God, you can, right. I read it today. All right. Uh, Let's piss off everybody. I'm going to flip through a uh, Sensation 1 comic fam. It's a good feeling. If you ever get a chance to, be careful. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously don't go nuts. It's still a old book. All right. But what we're looking at is a really, really clean copy. And when we were first hit with the collection and seeing it 
uh, you know, right at the beginning, I noticed that you were very excited, but also there was this like layer of control in your excitement because you knew that this wasn't like that, that finding the books was like half the battle. You started counting pages. You started looking for restoration. Like there's a whole process to it. So you mentioned staples, you mentioned light resto, like what's going on with this book and what would you expect this to, to get in this market? I think there's going to be extensive restoration for that. I think staples replaced. I don't know if there was trimming or not hard to tell, but it's got good page quality. You know, it's always hard to grade a book that's been restored because I'm not exactly fully, I don't fully know how they're going to uh, hit it, but let's just say. What do you think? If anything, I had a grade, I'd say maybe six, five extensive restoration. You know, it's probably if I had to guess a $15,000 book. Nope, nope. I think if I had to guess. <laughs> yeah, put the water in the cup, Ryan. I'm holding I'm it moving away. the Red Bull off yeah. the table. I'm I don't know why I didn't think about that. Yeah, I'm going to guess around there. Now, I read that book, and I'm going to tell you, reading these books makes you appreciate and understand why people liked these characters. Now, I can't say that for all Golden Age, but I read All-Star Comics 8, and it was a very compelling story. It's the last story in All-Star Comics number 8, and it then continues into this issue, okay? And... It's a fun character, and I'm not a huge H.G. Peters fan. He's the one who did the artwork, okay? But it was still really interesting, and there's some fun stuff in there. There's a game that she called called Bullets and Bracelets, and that was in All-Star Comics 8 and Sensation Comics 1. It's a game where people are shooting at her, and she's just playing bullets and bracelets, blocking That was one of the things she needed to do in All-Star Comics 8 to win this event that would allow her to go to the U.S. and drop off, uh, what's his name, Rogers? Steve Rogers? Not Steve Rogers, but that's Captain America. What's Steve uh, Trevor. Steve Trevor. Different Steve. Right? Bring him to the U.S. Okay, and that began her journey. And this issue, Sensation 1, I also, as I read it, realized that's where she got her name, Diana Prince, was from this issue. She took the job of the nurse taking care of Steve and traded jobs. So the Diana that was treating Steve retired and was given money from uh, Wonder Woman, who then took over her job and took on her last name, Diana Prince. And she became the nurse taking care of him, and that's how she adopted that name. she's an identity thief. Yes, and it's the craziest thing, because she won this money by being like this circus attraction, gave the money to the lady who who needed money to quit her job so she could marry her boyfriend, or fiancé, and so that's how she justified it. You go get the man of your dreams, and I'm going to go get the man of my dreams. So crazy, man. Sensation Comics, number one, on the table. And you saw Fire Guy Ryan's reaction to the next book. He about pooped himself, and I imagine it's because it's the Green Lantern. And I find it funny, Ryan, because there's so many times that I've talked about getting Alan Scott keys for you, and that's right. not of interest to you. Correct, but still, that doesn't prepare you to just be surprised with this book. All right. Well, at least it's sealed up in a coffin, so I can't really damage it as much. So I'm just going to. Well, the coffin damaged it. Look at that. It even chipped the top because of it. Oh, geez. Yep. What book are you looking at? This is All Star Comics issue number two, featuring uh, the Golden Age characters Spectre, Alan Scott Green Lantern, as well as Jay Garrick Flash. I, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, you got it. I mean, I thought you didn't know anything about this stuff. And look dude, at this, dude. You're, you're a just dropping knowledge, dude. I'm pretty cool. <laughs> Yo, this is really cool. This is super old and a very, very scarce book. What can you tell me about it? Also restored. It's encapsulated like that. Um, second appearance of what's Justice Society. Cons- oh, no, no. Right before the first appearance of the Justice Society, because All-Star Comics 3, they first appear. Um, I didn't get a chance to read this book, but it's 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 got six stories in it. Um, it's going to have those three characters are probably each going to have their own story and then some. Uh, a cool book. Part of this collection but I want to segue back into more Wonder Woman because there's also this Wonder Woman book. Here, before you do that, give me prices. Talk to me about what's, what, oh, what, what am I holding here? So All-Star Comics is a great DC t- title, okay? People love this title, and it's becoming more collectible. Um, it is restored. It still doesn't demand the highest prices. I would think that book, it looks like a 9-0 restored book. It's gorgeous, beautiful, probably extensive professional restoration. I'd assume maybe 6000 Six thousand for a All Star Comics number two. The yellows are bright, the reds are deep, and you have another Wonder Woman book right there. Hot damn! And this is what an example is of why you look through collections fully. We've seen two restored books here. 
Now, this is, Ryan, why don't you tell everybody who this is? Uh, here I'm holding Wonder Woman issue number one. Looks a lot worse than the other two, though. <laughs> it is rougher. It is rougher. But is also missing a centerfold. So now we have a surprise. Yeah, big key book missing a centerfold. So that will also affect the value. Um, if it didn't miss its centerfold, I could see that book being around a two five, maybe three zero, and could be let's say potentially a twenty plus thousand dollar book. But with the centerfold missing, being incomplete, it still has its value. It's probably still around eight to ten thousand. But if anyone has a centerfold for Wonder Woman one and doesn't want to charge me like ridiculous dumb numbers, please contact me. I have a confession. The last couple conventions, as I was going through some like random lawn boxes, I stumbled upon a centerfold for an FF20. I found a centerfold for Amazing Spider-Man 8, you know, and they were both $5 a piece. It was just a centerfold, like literally, uh, you know, connecting of two pages with a bag and board on the inside. And I thought to myself, I don't need that. And it's probably not worth five or ten dollars a piece that whatever he was charging but i had a moment where i'm like you know what i'm gonna buy these because there's maybe a day one day that i'll be looking at an ff20 and i'm gonna go i'm gonna go i know i have a centerfold somewhere i don't know where it is because by then i'll probably lose it but i have a problem i i i can't say no to that moment because this type of situation happens so often where you just need one page, one back cover to complete something. I had a Toss 39 like years ago that didn't have a back cover. And I had to find that back cover. I never did. Yeah. Uh, you know, playing the parts game, it's a tough and scary game. And I'll tell not even scary. It's just a tough game because you have these pieces and all it does is makes you want to find the remainders, whether it's a cover, where it's an interior. I have a lot of parts. I have a lot of coverless stuff, hoping that one day I'll marry because it's good stuff. But I think I've only done it once in like 15 years. But doesn't that one time make you keep getting them? It's making me more so because it's been so long, not want them. <laughs> it's, but I want them. It's a weird <laughs> dichotomy. But yo, this book that I'm looking at right now, I think was the very first one that I saw in the collection when those golden age books started coming out because they knew there was a difference with the old and the gold. They separated out the collection. They pulled out hundreds of golden age comics and said, Hey, you can look, go through the rest of the house and see the bronze, the silver, the, the indie, the boxes in the garage, the, the multiples of Deadpool 13, you know, to the amount of 25 copies in boxes that were sitting in there for years, decades. This book, though, was right on the top of the Batman run because they knew they had something good with Batman. And what are you looking at? Okay, so this is a Batman 4, and let me tell you why I brought it, okay? That's Sensation Comics 1 on the centerfold has a name and an address on it, okay? And the name was Ed Lamont. And I'm looking at this. I was like, God, why is that name so familiar? Okay, I'm thinking. I was like, I kind of feel like I know this name. So I Google the name, and it hits me. Ed Lamont was a fairly famous collector early on in the 40s through the 60s, and he wrote uh, articles, and he had articles written about him in certain fanzines, and I think he even had some published work in comics. So he's fairly well-known. So that Sensation Comics was his copy. It's got his Whoa. name in it. It's got his address in it. And it's his home address, I believe, when he was just a child in, like, the late 40s or 50s, okay? And there's an article about him that I found. And in that article had pictures of other books that he owned. One of them was a Batman 4. So I took this book, which happened to be in the collection as well, and I wanted to check it out, and I haven't looked yet, to see if his name is in here as well. So that's the reason I brought it, to just see possibly, could this also have belonged to him? You All haven't right. looked yet? So we're going to find no. out. Let me take a look at this book, Ryan. Dave. Uh -oh. Ah. Do you uh, want to be the oh, one? Oh, Ryan's going to do it. Oh, Comic fam. All right, this is a big moment. A we didn't worried. know this was going to be here. Ryan. <sighs> I'm a little worried. Give it to Ryan. Even, like, look at it and cast us. Uh, move that copy of World upon... Tree and take a look at this Batman number four. Just be careful with this. Can you tell me a little bit about the price while he looks in there? No. Yeah, Batman number four in this condition, because it's a fairly nice book. I got to tell you, I mean, God, looking at this book, if I had to give it a grade, 
Oh, it's attached to the top staple. Be care or bottom staple. Be careful, okay? Because it looks like it's not. Uh, this book probably with a press and a dry clean could potentially be a six zero six five. Damn, this could be a. Uh, I have to look up numbers, but if I had to speculate, fifteen thousand dollar book. All right, Ryan. I'm kind of worried welcome, even saying that. Welcome back to the show, Comic Fam. Hit the like and subscribe while Should we I, watch. I have, Ryan. I have a glove in my bag. Should I go get my glove? <laughs> no, don't use a glove. Talk, <laughs> just trust Guru. He's gonna uh, walk you through the process. Okay, get your other hand oh, here. Oh, hold geez. it up high. Oh jeez. No, no, other hand up back other on the hand. back. Support the back. Your left hand. Support the back. Yeah, hold I'm it right to there. Touch there the go. cover. No, touch the cover. Oh god. Oh my god, it's painful. Don't open any more than that. Oh god. And just go one by one, sir. All right, What's well, the joker in here? Oh, man. I think I'm sweating more than he is right he's now. He's making me sweat right now. Your nerves are, are uh These pages are like contagious. Towels. They're very thick. Yes. Right. So you Old notice. books have very thick paper. Oh, Thank you, Tom. All right. So he's flipping through. We're looking uh, for a name. See if this is part of the same collector's collection. Oh, yeah. God. Oh, my God. Ed Lamont. Look for that name if it's in there. He had it written on the centerfold in the sensation. I don't know if it's in there or not. Oh, we got an ad for Detective Comics 49. That's pretty cool. So a cool Joker story. Don't forget Superman this, uh, number nine ad. This yeah. podcast is available on SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. You're going to want to stay tuned because the podcast is back officially. Next time we have Golden Age Guru here, I asked him to pick out of the entire 350,000 comic books a favorite a unique collectible. And next time he's here, he's going to tell us what it was. And I'll uh, give you a little bit of a spoiler. It's already been graded and it's already been sold. Yeah. It's the only golden age book I sold in this collection. I'm trying not to, but it was such an oddity and interesting that I just felt I had to get it out of my hands and out into the market. So uh, yeah, I'm not seeing it. We already Past the centerfold. Past the center. Dude, you're doing great, by the way. Yeah, man. dude. I'm very scared. <laughs> this is going to be... You have to make sure to follow Fire Guy Ryan on Instagram. Give him some love and some kudos for going through a... There's pirates in here. $15,000 book. He's having a good time. Fun. Uh -huh. That's cool. Full page ad for World's... Uh, world's, world's Best Fi Comics number one. Yeah. yeah. Before they went to World's Finest in issue two. Exactly. Code? Oh, there's like a story in here. Like a prose text story in the back. Yeah, they'll have a lot of a lot of books. Will have that. Ginger Snap by Lou Reed. What the hell's mm -hmm. happening in the back here? This is. Just there's saw, all kinds of stuff in here. Yeah, somebody was just selling the first appearance of Ginger Snap on IG. Oh, I don't even know who Ginger Snap is. So let's add this up because although we don't have the name on the inside of this book, we do maybe have. Maybe it's in the back. Maybe you could it be on in the there. Page. You keep going. I'm almost done. But. You got it up to around 20 plus grand in just in these books here. Oh, yeah. Easy, oh, easy way over. Sensation. Closer to 30. Yeah, probably closer Oof. to 30. So what did you bring here in total today so, when we add this Batman mm. 4? I'm going to guess it's probably going to be an easy 40,000. Oh yeah. Drive careful, man. And it looks like there's no Ed <laughs> Lamont, but you know, mm. there there is an L on the front cover. So that's kind of cool. I mean, I don't know if that means anything because there's a lot of L's on comics. You'll notice in your as you collect. But. You know, dealers did different things to notate comic books, whether it was for their store and the retail side of things or collectors as well. We know many pedigrees that have uh, particular uh, marks on the comic symbols or even letters or numbers that will relate all the entire collection. And that's how you know what you're dealing with is something a little bit more special Comic fam, you need to go to your comic shop. You need to pick up a new comic book. We read it today. It's outstanding. I'm not surprised. It's by one of the best writers of our generation, James Tynan the fourth. Ryan, what did you bring here and make us both read? I didn't need any encouragement to read this. I actually made an exclusive for it. Shout out Carnivore Comics for teaming up on that because anything Jimmy T does, I'm all in. Same. Yeah, this is my favorite writer in comics right now. Uh, this is World Tree. It just dropped uh, today as we're recording this a couple of weeks ago. If you don't count the misprint that happened, this was uh, originally printed with a much darker cover. They had to go back to press and fix it. But we, were, I read this uh, when I got my pull list last night from Mill Geek Comics, and I decided we needed to talk about it today. I made the executive decision to bring this book to the table. We weren't planning on doing this segment, but I thought we needed to. I think it's. I think this is that good of a book. All right, so Jeff, this was your first read of the issue. 
James Tynan known for his work on Batman, but also a lot of horror narratives, whether it's something that's killing the children, Nice House on the Lake, Mimetic. Department of Truth. What did you think of World Tree? Um, for, first off, the very first page has a, a very compelling quote. I can't remember off of it. Can you read to me what it says, Ryan, really fast? Because um, I found this so interesting and something I could feel that I could regurgitate. Open it, Ryan. I want to hear it. Oh. Yes. There we go. Well done. That's a good sound, dude. I was, trying, really to, I was trying to wait and not interrupt you, but that's You have fine. to open it, and the comic fam can understand that there's going to be tape pulling in our videos. Not on the comics, though. The quote says, Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. Harlan Ellison from I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. I love that line. How much I hate you since, what, the day I started to live? I mean, that's just such a burn and a half. And I read that. I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty This is going to be a fun, uplifting, happy book. Yes. What did James Tynan say, though? He says it's like his, one of his, if not the most brutal book Correct. that he's written. Yeah, he, he self-referred to his own book as being very brutal, and I, I definitely agree. Uh, something about like something is killing the children feels kind of like, I don't want to say fun, but it's kind of <laughs> safe and like light, lighthearted in a sense, you know? There's something to it. Like you never, I don't feel like I'm gonna be hurt by reading this. I don't feel like it's gonna mess up my day or like really sit in my skull like this book did. Dude, you went and brought something that's killing the children hardcover to a freaking damn playground for you I to did. read on the bench. I read at the that's park. how much fun it, it is. Like I want to go to the playground. park. <laughs> it's a sunny day. I want to go enjoy my comic books. Uh, yeah, yeah, probably wrong was, book to read. But that was unfortunate. Yeah, I didn't didn't plan it that way. So it's a super nice day outside, and. My Saturday is free, so I decided to take a comic book to the park. Uh, lots of kids, playground stuff, but I think I picked the wrong comic. Initial reactions, Jeff. Okay, uh, initial reactions is it's uh, in the beginning it takes a minute, but just like any book, to get caught up into what's happening. But by the end of it that I like, despite the fact that it's tech-related, it's violent, the art's interesting and good, um, the story is well paced. Is that by the end of I want to read the I want to read the next issue. Art by Fernando Blanco, by the way. Really cool, really cool art in here. It's very uh, expressive, uh, cartoony, but also clear and uh, good. So, is the reason why you are so excited to bring this for the big surprise that this was to me? Did James Tynan the fourth write a freaking slasher? I think so. We've been talking about our comic Crashdown a lot and writing horror comics and how how fun it is, at least on the back end, and what other sort of genres in horror, sub-genres, we might want to dabble with moving forward. And the word slasher horror has come up, I'd say, more than any other sub-genre after sci-fi horror that Crashdown is. And yeah, after reading this, I'm definitely like, it's got my brain like firing and cooking in a, in a completely different way and wanting to think about certain other kind of stories we could try and write in the genre. You kind of equate that to a slasher story right there? Well, there's this character on the front, and we're not going to like do any spoilers do here. Not want to, I went into this book cold, and you I have think to go that, into that it helps. Cold. Yeah, But um, but yeah, no, absolutely. Um, what you, what this has been uh, previewed as, like for, for the info that I know about the book, when I did the exclusive and I did my research and I read about like the synopsis, I did not pick up on what this book actually was going to be about. Rather... It was there's loosely technology horror based for sure. I mean, it's like it's called World Tree and it's it's like, uh, you know, spazzing out text, uh, computer. The E's are threes. Yeah, exactly. You know, like code and stuff. And, you know, I was getting some mimetic vibes, which is why I was so excited about this to begin with. But but yeah, no, we have like a, an antagonist in here that is that is brutal. And James Tynan was right. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't read Mimetic. Um, if I'd have related to a movie of any kind, I thought it was more like a horror matrix, sure. basically concept to it. By the end of it, I was like, oh, okay, this that's kind of fun, a little edgier, a little more violent. Yeah, I dig that. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be my favorite book of this week, and uh, you should be able to find it at your LCS. It just dropped this week, and I I definitely recommend it. It's certainly my jam if you're into horror and if you have a strong stomach, because this is a little little graphic. There's a there's a lot of murder that happens in this issue. It's a shocking amount of murder. Okay, so real talk, Ryan. We've talked about this this thing with reading comics, particularly with your taste. How much of this book do you enjoy? Because of the Jimmy T goodness, the, the 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 reveals, the scariness, the the horror, the grotesque, and how much of it is because it's got nudity? 
There's a little bit of nudity in here. There's a there's more than a little bit of nudity right. in here. A little here. bit of casual nudity. There's she's pubic naked. hair. She's naked on the cover. In this book. I believe. Yeah. Pretty sure, she's, pretty she's, sure she's sitting there naked on the cover. Is that the real reason why you that's really the, enjoy this book? Spoilers. Yeah, that's the real reason. Comic fam, you got to re- read World Tree. You got to read everything James Tynan IV is putting out. He's fantastic. Oh, we're in Vegas. Quick shot in Vegas at... Scott's Collectibles, and you know who Scott's Collectibles reps. Oh, we got Jimmy T. I wonder if I can ask him some questions about World Tree. He's got a huge line. Oh my goodness. Wow. We got some love for the horror master. You know what? Shameless plug. Bjorn Berens, 500 printed. Shout out Carnivore Comics. First on deck for the signing is my exclusive. It's not even my book right here. It's just my exclusive, but I got to show it off. James, World Tree. <laughs> you said it was the most brutal comic you've ever written. I'm hoping you can talk about it. Absolutely. No, I mean, like, this is a story, this is an idea that's been in my head for years. Uh, you know, I wanted to dig right into the heart of what scares me about what the internet's doing to our culture uh, and to us as people. And I wanted to do that in the most brutal way possible. And, you know, with the help of uh, Fernando Blanco, and uh, Jordi Belair, uh, like, you know, I think we pulled it off. <laughs> Bravo, sir. Thank you. Looking great, by the way. Dude's killing it at the gym. I'm watching Boss yeah. Logic kill it at the gym with his team. It's really cool to see, like, members of the comic fam, creatives, go into the gym. It's motivating me to go to the gym. So shout out to both of them. Motivating me to sign up for a gym. Going to it. I haven't done that yet, but I'm signing up for a gym. I've been telling myself for a week, so I'm doing it. Hit the like, slap the subscribe button. Podcast 71 has been completed and the Bags and Boards show is back. Hit up your LCS, ask him about Crashdown, and as always. I give it to Jeff. I say it all the time. Geek responsibly. Nuff. Said. The Bags and Boards podcast is back. I am Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo, and make sure you get crashed down on July 5th.